which is coming from University of Oregon, and we will talk about stable minimal cycle. All right, thanks. So I want to start by saying some, some basic things, and then uh, give an overview of what I, uh, a project that went into my thesis, and along the way hopefully mention some uh, related areas. So if you're interested in it, you can uh, ask me more about it, or maybe you want to tell me more about it. I, I don't know, one of the two. Uh, okay, so I uh, want to talk about Romanian manifolds. So we have manifold, Romanian metric. And from this information, uh, you get a scalar curvature function. I'll write it R sub G. That's a function on the manifold. <coughs> and we say that uh, this MG is positive scalar curvature, abbreviated PSC, uh, if the scalar curvature function is positive. OK. So to uh, get ourselves thinking a little bit about this, let's give an example. <coughs> OK, so if you have a Riemannian metric on the two torus, uh, then if you integrate the scalar curvature function and you look at the bottom right corner of the wall out there, it'll tell you it's uh, what will be 4 pi times the Euler characteristic of the torus, which is 0. So what does that tell us about uh, positive scalar curvature on the torus? Well, that can't happen. You know, this can't be positive, and you integrate it, you get 0. It can't happen. So uh, the P2 has no positive scalar curvature metric. OK, that's one example. One, one investigation there. Uh, let's, uh, so manifolds with boundary will also come up here. So let's get an example of a manifold with boundary. Uh, so another example. Let's, again, think of a surface. And uh, let's take the sphere, uh, but subtract two disks from it. So like a disk around the north pole, disk around the south pole, for instance. <clears throat> OK, and you put any metric on uh, this manifold. Uh, and you integrate its scalar curvature. Uh, but the gauss binet formula for manifolds with boundary also involves the mean curvature of the boundary with respect to an outward pointing normal vector. The boundary of sigma you integrate its mean curvature. So this quantity will be equal to the Euler characteristic of this thing, which is also zero. Why it's a kind of analogous example. You know, this thing has the same homotopy type as the circle, as Euler characteristic zero. Uh, so here you don't see any immediate obstruction to uh, this guy admitting positive scalar curvature. Because you know, if this is zero, well, or you know, this could be positive, but then this term cancels it out. But you can observe that uh, so the sigma has no has no metric G such that, so one, it's positive scalar curvature. And also, the, if you make the additional requirement that the mean curvature of its boundary is 0. So the boundary of sigma is minimal with respect to the metric G. So there's no, there's no G that both of these things happen at the same time. So what I'm trying to get at here is that uh, this should be an analysis, analogous example. So it shouldn't have a positive scalar curvature metric. and uh, you need to require some boundary conditions. And I'm saying that these are good boundary conditions. So, so what is exactly the condition you use the word minimal? Uh, yeah, minimal. So in other words, uh, the mean curvature is identically 0 on the boundary. Okay. Yeah. So these are your good, good boundary conditions. Because of the theorem. Okay. Yes. It's good because of the theorem in this case. Yeah, because it's kind of like all the correct right. characteristic 0, we should have an, no answer to both of these situations. Yeah, thanks. OK, and let me, <clears throat> so there's a lot of different directions you can go from dimension 2 to higher dimensions. This is very much a dimension 2, you know, Gauss-Binet. Uh, so here's one direction you can go in. So there's a work by Shane and Yao in the late 70s uh, that gives a relationship between uh, positive scalar curvature metrics and stable minimal piper services. So let me, let me describe that. So if you have so some hypersurface, by hypersurface I mean co-dimension one uh, embedded some manifold. Let me just say embedded here. <coughs> Being a manifold with positive scalar curvature. Uh, and it's a stable minimal hypersurface. So stable minimal. And what do I mean by these words here? I mean uh, it's a critical point of the volume functional. And it's uh, you know it minimizes the second order. So in other words, you know you take the derivative of the volume functional at sigma at zero. So this is the same as this is the same as the mean curvature of sigma is identically zero. Uh, and uh, also minimizes the second order. So take two derivatives of volume. 
at sigma is greater than or equal to zero. So and this condition is a little bit harder to write down explicitly. It's not, not exactly, yeah, it's, a, it's a integral inequality for every perturbation that you make uh, for sigma, you know, of sigma. Okay, so if you're in the situation where you have positive scalar curvature manifold, uh, and it should be, well, let me just state it in the case where this is, uh, you know, closed, oriented, and this thing here is two-sided. Maybe I shouldn't be so technical, but I just want to be precise here. So the, nor the normal bundle of this embedding is trivial. That's what I mean by two-sided. Uh, so if you're in this situation, then the sigma will also have a positive scalar curvature metric. So then sigma also has a positive scalar curvature metric. And it won't be the restriction metric, but it will uh, actually be conformal. You know, Shane and Yao in this, this work showed that it will be conformal to the restriction metric. Uh, or another way you could say that uh, is that the conformal manifold sigma comma the restriction metric, that conformal class, is Yamabe positive. So this has some kind of interaction with the Yamabe problem, or at least this linearization. <coughs> okay, uh, so that is a fact. And for it to be useful, we need to find lots of uh, examples of uh, stable minimal hyperservices. So this is uh, used in junction with the facts from geometric measure theory, so which I'll also state here. So geometric measure theory from the 50s due to Federer, Fleming, and De Georgie uh, gives a source of these stable minimal hyperservices in the following way. So if <coughs> you have a Riemannian manifold, and this should be closed and oriented, it doesn't need to be positive scalar curvature, but that's how we're going to be using it. Uh, and you have <coughs> a non-trivial co-dimension one homology class, integral homology class. Uh, then you can do a minimization process, uh, find all the, the hyperservices that represent alpha and try to find the one of minimal area. And if uh, the dimension is small enough, in this case n should be less than or equal to 7, <coughs> then there exists a, a hyperservice w1 minus 1 in m, two-sided embedded, uh, that represents, and I'll be a little bit think about this, but it represents up to multiplicity, but I'm going to say it represents uh, the class alpha. <clears throat> and uh, so, so far I haven't said anything. Uh, you can always represent a co-dimension one homology class in a manifold, oriented manifold with a, with a sub-manifold like this. Uh, but the result is that it's uh, a smallest volume among all representatives of alpha. So uh, with the smallest volume. And it's still a smooth. Yeah, for n less than or equal to 7, it'll be a smooth uh, hypersurface. So if you go to 8 or higher dimensions, uh, you can do this minimization procedure and uh, get a minimizing what's called a, a current, something a little bit more general than a surface. Uh, but it will have singularities in general. But if you're in 7 and below, there's regularity theory that says that those singularities won't happen. OK. <clears throat> Going a little bit slow here. Uh, so I'll just say some applications of these two things together. Uh, you can look at uh, the torus in these dimensions, dimensions n less than or equal to 7. Uh, <coughs> and you can kind of iterative, iteratively apply this procedure and uh, show that if the torus had a positive scalar curvature metric uh, and you do some procedure that you iterate, then you would get a positive scalar curvature metric on T2, which we know can't happen. So this proves that, uh, so in this paper, Fain Yao proved that the torus doesn't have a positive scalar curvature metric in this. <coughs> oh, yeah, so uh, the fact that, so, yeah, so by this, this stability condition, that's just for very small perturbations. Uh, it's a condition just for small perturbations. Uh, and those will preserve the homology class. So if you make one of these small perturbations, then you are still representative, so your volume can't get bigger or can't get smaller. Curvature. You didn't mention curvature here. Right, yeah, curvature is not involved in this geometric measure theory statement. But, but these two things are used together. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> and also, uh, they're used together to give the first counterexample to uh, Gromov, Loss, and Rosenberg conjecture. But so this is n less than or equal to 8 because n minus 1 you want to get. Uh, so the ambient manifold should be dimension uh, 7 or below. And uh, singularity has to. Yeah, 
Yeah, there's the singular cone in uh, R8. Yeah. <clears throat> okay, so let me uh, talk about the second uh, pair of words uh, in the title: uh, positive scalar curvature boredism. So, positive scalar curvature boredism. <clears throat> okay, so if we have two positive scalar curvature manifolds, uh, say y0, g0, these should be closed, oriented, uh, in the same dimension, y1, g1. They're both positive scalar curvature. Then they are bordant, or positive scalar curvature bordant, uh, if there exists well an oriented bordism between them z and some positive scalar curvature metric uh, g bar. And I'll just draw a picture of this. So it's a, there'll be an oriented borism between y0 and y1 in the sense that its boundary is y0, destroying union, opposite orientation on y1. Uh, and this positive scalar curvature metric should restrict to g0 and g1 on the sides, and it should have a product structure, a little colored region where this metric g bar splits as a product, g0 plus dt squared, and the same on the other side. Okay. <clears throat> so that's the notion of positive scalar curvature boredism. <clears throat> and so you have uh, interesting boredism groups. When you take a product, you don't destroy GSC. Right, yeah. <clears throat> so you have uh, yeah, so you even get a ring as well. Yeah. yeah. So uh, not much is known about these groups, uh, so I'll tell you uh, one of the best sort of results in this direction about these groups. So here's a fact. Here's your, uh, my advisor, Boris Botvinnik, and Peter Gilkey from the 90s, uh, that says the following. So let's consider a following sort of manifold, uh, a spherical space form, Sn mod gamma, where gamma is non-trivial. And n is odd, n is bigger than or equal to 5, and uh, this manifold here is spin. So that's, that's kind of some condition on gamma. <clears throat> OK, so if you have a manifold like this, then there exists countable collection of metrics, call them gj, uh, such that the manifolds x comma gj are pairwise non-bordant, non-PSC bordant. So here we have a, you know, this is, says there's a, uh, you know, this group has an infinite collection of uh, elements here that are, that are not bordant to each other. <clears throat> okay, so you, by the group that I'm talking about is you take all positive scalar curvature manifolds up to this relation, you get a group. And so this says there's infinitely many non-trivial elements in it. <clears throat> okay, so here's a question that uh, you can ask and that we asked. Uh, we could you take... Can connect this sum? Yeah, yeah, yeah in, in the yeah. dimensions at least three, yeah. <clears throat> yeah, so you could take the... Well, yeah, I won't say more about that. Uh, so you could ask the example, uh, you could take these, uh, you could ask what about the manifolds that you get. You take uh, these examples here, x, and you cross them with s1, and take the product metric. These, uh, these uh, metric PSC metrics here, from, the, from this fact that I just said, plus d theta squared. <coughs> so the x with the gj's, those are not PSC bordant. You know, you can't have a z like this. Uh, but what about these manifolds? After you cross them with S1, do they suddenly, after crossing with S1, become PSC bordant? Or is this property preserved after crossing with S1? Okay, and the answer <coughs> that we kind of have here is uh, uh, these are PSC non bordant, or I should say non PSC bordant, <coughs> uh, for. Uh, so we have to use some geometric measure theory here, and there's not much of an overlap between the, the dimensions that uh, work for both of these things. We get them for n is 5 and 7. Uh, yes. And uh, I should put some qu uh, quotation marks around here because uh, it's not exactly the same notion of boredism uh, as up there. It requires some extra structure that uh, respects this S1 factor. But let me get into that a little bit. Oh, yeah. Hmm. So they're all more than zero or something, but they're all not more than each other. So they'll be null bordant. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. 
can probably still do that. Yeah. So there's some extra condition. That's why you put the quotation marks. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 Okay. Get me worried for a second. Thank you. <coughs> okay. So let me. Uh, uh, yeah, so the answer is yes, uh, if you didn't have the quotation marks. But I have this extra condition that the Borism, the Borism needs to carry some extra structure. Uh, it needs to also have a map to S1 that. Uh, oh, oh, oh. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll say it in a second. <clears throat> okay. So here's, how the, here's what the, the hope is for, proving, or for answering the question. Uh, so here's the idea. <clears throat> so suppose yes, uh, that there does exist, uh, uh, you know, say G zero and G one from this collection that are PSC bordered. Uh, then there will be a manifold Z. Uh, let's see, but and this should be n plus two <coughs> G bar, uh, uh, which is a borism between these two things. I'll try. <laughs> A little bit differently. So here is some some z g bar, p z borism. <coughs> uh, here we have uh, uh, this x cross s one. Here we have the x cross s one. You have the different metrics on one and the other, g zero on one side, g zero g one on the other side. Okay, uh, with some extra information, which is uh, a homology class, relative homology class. H n plus one z boundary of z <coughs> with uh, the boundary of this alpha bar being the classes represented by slices, you know x over here and a slice x over here. So slice x, slice x. So it would be like x disjoint union minus x, like that. So that's some of this extra structure that I was talking about. <coughs> okay. So in particular, this would have to be non-trivial. Uh, so that example. Where you have the the uh, x cross the disk uh, won't satisfy this extra condition here that you have this alpha bar. <coughs> okay, uh, so then the idea is uh, step one of the idea would be to uh, produce an analog of the Shane and Yao uh, technique where you have this stable minimal condition uh, implying some hereditary property of the positive scalar curvature, and you have uh, some geometric measure theory like this, to do the following sort of thing. So you produce a <coughs> uh, sub-manifold and uh, plus one here inside z uh, with it represents the class alpha bar <coughs> and its positive scalar curvature in the right sense, meaning that uh, there exists a conformal metric on w, which is positive scalar curvature and makes the boundary of W minimal. OK, so if I drew this picture, or drew W in this picture, it would be like some manifold with boundary. Since remember, the boundary of W needs to represent the class x, this one union minus x up here. This would be W here. <coughs> uh, and then we do a similar argument to the Shane Yao to show that uh, you can find a conformal metric on W that uh, is positive scalar curvature. However, and I'm won't be able to get into the problems too much, uh, but so this isn't. This is very far from a positive scalar curvature borism from uh, one side to the other. Uh, for instance, we don't even know that the boundary of W is equal to X, this joint union X, and we don't know that the boundary of W uh, is going to be uh, area minimizing representative of this class either. <clears throat> so we don't even know that the boundary of W has a positive scalar curvature metric. But you can do one thing, and I'll be quick about this, we do step two. Uh, so this is very much like the Shane Yao argument. This is a little bit something different. We can form uh, another bordism where we attach long collars to the ends of Z. So we have like a, we, you know, the, the bordism has a product structure near the boundary, so we can plop on very long collars and make another smooth bordism <coughs> between X cross S1 and X cross S1. Z L, where we've attached collars of length L here. And then we can apply step one again, and you get another WL that minimizes the class alpha in this new manifold. <coughs> you know, still diffeomorphic, still has this class alpha, 
bar so we can still use this step one again. <coughs> and then the next thing we do is we apply you know, lots of tools from uh, convergence or compactness properties for these stable minimal hypersurfaces and uh, uh, look at uh, the process of finding these conformal metrics, which is some eigenvalue problem. And we study this behavior as you make these collars longer and longer and longer. And we eventually find that as you make the L goes to infinity, these WLs will actually converge to slices. Uh, <coughs> X cross, you know, some big, you know, X cross, you know, say some big interval, X cross and big interval. And uh, <coughs> we use some, some elbow grease from there to change WL for very large L into one of the desired boardisms uh, from X on one side to X on the other. So in the end, the picture is you get some <clears throat> you have a x here, x here. You get this bordism, I don't know what call it, omega infinity or w infinity <clears throat> from one side to the other. Uh, and that contradicts the, uh, this fact that I wrote down earlier about uh, <clears throat> the fact that g0 and g1 were not PSC board, you know, that we had those examples that were not PSC board. So this w infinity would counter, contradict that uh, original fact that I wrote down. So that's the idea there. All right. Thanks for listening. Questions? What you're really assuming is, is that there is a, a map to the circle on, on the boardism which restricts to the uh, Yeah, the yeah. Uh, you could say it in terms of, uh, yeah, the oriented boardism groups with maps to B, S1. Or, Easy. Yeah. That's the appropriate boards and groups that I'm saying here. Yeah. One, one, one comment is uh, uh, usually uh, in geometric discussions, like in algebraic geometry, you don't really have manifolds with boundary complex, right? So it's all very interesting when you can have a geometric study where you have manifolds with boundary. In fact, when you have a taller neighborhood of the boundary, it stays positive for curvature or something. So it makes sense to talk about mm. things about it. So there's a nice boardism theory here. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So what what are some of the general questions uh, you'd like to know about this? General yeah. So theory? as far as I know, yeah, this is I think uh, well, first examples like this in even dimension. So it, the those original examples, the spherical space forms in odd dimensions, they rely on uh, some index theory invariant that only uh, works first well thing. in odd dimensions. So. Uh, there's another uh, index invariant for uh, manifolds of this form, x cross s1. Uh, you, you look at the universal cover, and you look at the Dirac operator there, and there's an interesting uh, index theory invariant. And uh, so this, this was kind of the first step in a, a project to study that invariant as well. So that's kind of the next direction in this area. So you mentioned along the way that uh, it's sort of interesting to ask Questions where you have uh, you assume that your boundary is minimal, and you have positive scalar curvature inside. So here, when you're looking at this boardism theory, in order to paste things in the end, you're actually assuming that the ends are totally geodesic. But mm -hmm. are some of the some of the key lemmas that you prove along the way just depend upon the fact that the end of the boundary is minimal. Yeah. So the main uh, problem with the end of step one is we have this uh, positive scalar curvature manifold with the boundary being minimal. But one of the biggest things that stops that from being a positive scalar curvature boardism is it doesn't have a product structure near the boundary. And uh, you know, it was confusing for a while. I was hoping that the uh, volume minimizing representative of alpha bar would maybe have a little bit of a product structure near its boundary, but it doesn't. And kind of working around that. Um, but, but you're not trying to solve like a, a free boundary plateau problem or something like that, right? Uh, so the, this, the, the WLs, those are, so it's not a plateau problem, but it's a free boundary problem. Yeah, these, these, I didn't mention it, but these WLs are uh, yeah, free boundary, stale, minimal hypersurfaces. They come from using a, uh, analogous geometric measure theory from the, from the 80s due to Michael Grunter uh, that says you can do this minimization process for the alpha bars, and you get uh, manifolds with boundary, hypersurfaces with boundary in here, properly embedded. Yeah. So their boundary is floating around here, and the boundary of Z 
uh, but it might not on the nose be X until you make the collars very, very long. And they get closer to, to that. So uh, if you assume this, uh, some spin conditions, I'm going to try to use the jack operator to re remove this dimension uh, Yeah, the, the problem is, uh, <coughs> so on the, uh, the, the, old, the old fact that I wrote down where you just have the spherical space form, uh, it, that, and you have some index theory invariant that tells you that uh, you got these, all these different examples. That relies heavily on knowing how to compute that index theory invariant for the spherical space forms. And there's no, uh, no analog for this, it doesn't seem. So there's, no, um, there's nothing like that so far, I haven't seen. Some some way of getting at a result like this just using that. This looks like something like it, it, it using some kind of pair of homology classes mm -hmm. of this X one. So uh, in a, in, a, in a kind of proof of this, uh, uh, mass conjecture, people use some classes of homology class variant mass spaces to get right for some time. Mm. I mean, and Gromov and Rosen proved this kind. Of they use some kind of almost flat boundaries and so on. Twist the jack operator by this kind of thing to calculate this. Uh, this kind of classes again. Okay. Hmm. Another question is that this, this, this theorem says that you have kind of many connected components on the space of positive yeah. error culture. Are there any kind of possible way to get some? Not trivial homology class. Oh, yeah. So this doesn't quite say. Uh, I don't think this gives you different connected components. Uh, no, but, yeah, yeah, yeah. but my question is that if you have this family version, so that kind of things give you some possible way to get some non trivial homology class. Oh, okay, yeah. Okay, yeah. I haven't thought about that. That's a good point. That seems possible. So it, it, it seems to be important here that, I guess, just to get down into the right dimensional range, you're, you have to use non simply connected examples, right? Otherwise, you have the Gromov Lawson trick to, uh, to say that you can pass from anything to anything via surgeries in the right photo dimension. Mm -hmm. It's only, uh, so it, it, is that somehow rigged up that you're looking at? Oh, uh, do your bordisms have any particular uh, property with respect to? Uh, yeah, so what I stated here is a specific case of what I was, what, what I show in the paper. Uh, and yeah, it's stated in terms of, uh, R1 is isomorphism. well, it's just, it's just uh, stated in terms of triples, you know, Y, G, and homology classes, H, uh, N minus 1, Y, D. So, so you can do this procedure, not just with things like X cross S1, but, uh, uh, Anything with a non-trivial co-dimension one homology class, yeah, and then uh, all this the same procedure would apply, yeah. And there's the the full statement involves uh, relating the what you get when applying the Shane Yao technique to this alpha because this is you know closed manifold co-dimension one homology class. You can use the Shane Yao technique to get a minimal hypersurface in Y with positive scalar curvature, and <coughs> you can do this procedure. Then you get a bordism between the two uh, minimizers you get from the Shane Yao. In this case, it's just the slice x cross some point in S1, but yeah, you also have the general thing. 